We are on Nintendo Power number 54 for March of 1994, approaching the end of the magazine's sixth year. This issue, we have the nominees for the sixth annual Nestor Awards to look forward to, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land. The art is conventional 2D art, looks fine, but isn't anything special. In the table of contents, following up on the lineup from last issue, the only NES game this issue is Star Tropics 2, the game, same game from last issue. So, this is my first issue of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, covering a regular issue of Nintendo Power that has no coverage of NES games. The theme for the letters of this issue is rather informal and appears to be on, focusing on instances where your preconceptions about games don't match what the games actually were. Of note, this issue is Willow, Fester's Quest, and Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Continuing with follow-ups, we have a follow-up for the sports roundup from last issue with coverage of NBA Jam, which gets in-depth the game's roster, featuring the golden age of the Portland Trail Blazers, which doesn't account for much, because we're also in the golden age of the Chicago Bulls and Air Beats Glide, unfortunately. NBA Jam is one of those basketball games that is incredibly fun against another person, but can be kind of frustrating against the computer, because the AI has run rubber banding and at really bad times. It basically tends to go towards ties towards the end of the first and third quarters, and will crank up the difficulty at the end of the game. This works great in the arcade when you're pumping in quarters. It's frustrating on the console. So I'd consider NBA Jam, as far as sports games go, an ideal game to have if you're in a dorm or have roommates, but not necessarily for solo play. Just in time for 2018, we have the Super Nintendo port of the first game in the series that led to a title that it was in a lot of people's Game of the Year rankings. I refer, of course, to Wolfenstein 3D, which led ultimately to Wolfenstein the New Colossus. Yes, technically there were a couple Wolfenstein games before this that were stealth action games on the Apple II and that sort of thing, but this series more draws its lineage from Wolfenstein 3D and B.J. Blazkowicz. Anyway, we have some maps of the first three missions, as well as recommendations that you draw your own maps for the levels so you can keep track of where you are. The Super Nintendo version of Wolfenstein 3D isn't terrible. To be clear, the graphics are pixelated mess, aiming is something of a pain in the rear, and turning with the controller is shockingly sluggish, especially compared to turning with the keyboard on the PC. However, I notice something of a generous auto-aim at distance, which becomes more restrictive as enemies approach the player and their sprites are more defined. Additionally, the shoulder buttons are used to strafe, which is something that I don't recall being enabled by default in the PC version of Wolfenstein 3D. You had to go in and configure buttons for strafing. It does bear mentioning that all the Nazi imagery in the game has been culled. Instead, you're fighting the Master State, a little bit of cheekiness to get around the Nintendo sensors, and the Nazi attack dolls, dogs have been replaced with giant rats. Next is Stunt Race FX, a racing game using the Super FX chip. We have notes on the different vehicles, but not on the tracks. Stunt Race FX is a game with a good idea, but some real issues with the execution. It is, in short, a racing game designed to use the Super FX chip to allow for polygonal graphics both in the racers and in the environments. The problem with this is that the Super Nintendo just doesn't run fast enough to do this well. There are issues with pop-in and level environments, especially with levels that try to do tunnels or stuff with transparency. This is particularly an issue if you're using some of the faster racers. The fastest racers in the game are actually able to drive faster than the game is able to load, so you have level obstacles coming out of nowhere as the game drops stuff out of memory and brings stuff in. I appreciate the ambition in the game design. I always appreciate ambition in the game design, but it doesn't quite work here. Next is a roundup on CES 1994, and with it some updates on Project Reality, aka the Nintendo 64. They slip it in there, but they mention that Project Reality will still use cartridges, with Jim Clark at SGI hyping the access speed of cartridges over CDs to justify their choice with going with CDs as opposed to Sega and Sony. 
History is not exactly on Nintendo's side on this front. Next is R-Type 3. We haven't had a shoot 'em up in a while, so I'm glad to have a new one. This game has several variants to the R-Type Force, each with different abilities. We also get maps of the first six levels. R-Type 3 is a good home port of a shooter. While like in the earlier R-Type games, it uses checkpointing in the middle of, middle of levels, unlike in earlier games when you game over, where you went back to the beginning of the level, here you start back at the last checkpoint, just like when you die normally. It's a really good way of executing this. That, combined with Unlimited Continues, makes the game feel a lot more approachable as a shoot 'em up, but without dumbing down the difficulty. Other than that, the game lets you select which power up path you can go through with three different forces, which you select at the beginning of the game, which also works incredibly well, as it lets you pick a path that fits with your playstyle and also allows for a degree of replay value. Speaking of interesting genres, Next is Metal Marines, which appears to be a real-time strategy game, the second RTS we've gotten thus far, besides Simant. Metal Marines is really interesting in the context of RTS games. Simant works in a way similar to how I described Herzog's Vi, where you have a hero unit, the Red Ant, that you control, and use to direct resource scattering and attacks. In Metal Marines, you have a slightly more common model, if you're familiar with PC real-time strategy games, where you have bases and subsidiary buildings built around that base to expand your ability to attack. It's really close to modern real-time strategy games, except it works at a much faster pace. You and your enemy both prepare for an attack at a very quick pace, with first attacks happening within a minute of the clock starting. You don't have to worry about resource gathering as resources tick in at a regular rate. Where the twist comes in is how you do attacks. You and your opponents are on different islands. You scout the enemy base by launching missiles at it, giving you a brief snapshot of their base. Also, the presentation of the game is very anime, which I like, as it shows that at this point game developers are no longer feeling like they have to hide the appearance of a game being Japanese in order to pander to, well, racists. Next up is Flintstones, Treasure of Sierra Madrock. Unlike the earlier Flintstone games, instead of being a platformer, this is a combination board game and mini-game like Mario Party. My assessment of what this game is was rather wrong. It is structured like a board game, but instead of going between an assortment of mini-games, it goes between an assortment of conventional platforming levels based on your die roll. I'm not a fan of this, it's clunky, structurally. Other than this, the game plays fairly well, with the levels having some decent design, and the characters controlling fairly well. But, basically, you get to pick which level you go to by random chance, which makes it hard to choose a strategy or focus on learning a particular level, which is kind of the thing with platformers. You play levels over and over and you learn them. Whereas if you're, what level you go to is ultimately at random, that is pretty much Scuttles that in the bud. Now, it's been almost 10 years since the Famicom came out in Japan, and because then, over this time, various schools have sprung up in Japan with dedicated programs on game development. We get a rundown of five schools, three corporate sponsored and two academic programs with breakdowns of each of their curriculum. It's interesting seeing this particularly now where you have a wider variety of schools in the United States that have dedicated game development programs like DigiPen, for example. In classified information, we have a 7 continue code for Super Empire Strikes Back. In the Super Metroid comic, we get a whole bunch of dialogue with the Galactic Federation stating skepticism about the activity of the space pirates on Ze Zebes, and Samus deciding to go it alone. Samus also gets a male rival named Houston. In Counselor's Corner, we have more tips for Seventh Saga, a full map of the Third Floor and Dungeon Master, and a full text walkthrough of Star Tropics. We now come to our cover game, Super Mario Land 3, with Mario's first starring go. We have maps of the first eight consecutive levels and a spattering of later levels. Mario Land, Super Mario Land 3, is a game that is slower and more deliberately placed than any of the other Super Mario Brothers games are, but it's got a bit more bite to it. Wario, as a sprite, is big and squat, and that reflects his animations and his movement speed and the power-ups he uses. 
all of these in combination really make it clear that Wario is a very, very different character than, character than Mario and Luigi are, giving him his own unique flavor, and also giving the way the game is structured and how the levels are designed a very different flavor to them as well. We got the continuation of the guide for Zoda's Revenge from last issue. As I covered the game last month, I'm not going to be re-reviewing it. We now have the nominees for the Nestor Awards for 1993. Because there are nominees for each platform on each category, I'm just going to throw a graphic up on screen with my picks for each category. In the top 20 rankings, Street Fighter 2 Turbo dropped down the NES rankings, while Tetris 2 went to number 1 with a bullet on the NES. Of note in the now playing column is Romance of the Three Kingdoms 3, Undercover Cops, Legend, Lost Mission, and Wizardry 5. In Pack Watch, Super Metroid is on the way. It was tough for me to pick just one game this issue. A pick of the issue is Metal Marines, with Wario Land coming in a close second. For all of the wailing and gnashing of teeth for years to come over how RTS games don't work on consoles, with ports of StarCraft and Command and & Conquer and that sort of thing, Metal Marines is a game that makes the concept work fairly well because it feels like the game was designed from the ground up for a console. That said, it's also incredibly expensive for you to get on eBay with as the time of this recording, copies going for in the eighty to a hundred dollar range or more, depending on how complete it is or the condition of the game. Hence Wario Land being a backup choice. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and please click the notification button to be notified whenever new episodes of this show go live. If you really like the show, please consider backing my Patreon at patreon.com slash count0or. Backers can view episodes up to one week early, and also pick future games for Let's Plays. Thank you for watching.